Good morning. Can you hear me? So there's like 50 people that are scattered across 450 chairs. This, this course is going to depend a lot on audience participation. That's the way we set it up. We didn't realize that we would be in a gigantic room. So if you could find it inside yourselves to move forward so that we can have that conversation, that would be really, really helpful. Well, no, because you, we can hear your voice in there. <laughs> you're forward enough. <laughs> You know, some people should stay at the back of the room and sing. Which ones? We'll point them out. Yeah, we know who they are. Ooh. I lose my balance when I shut my glossy box. Yes. Okay. You Thank you ever so much. Good. Did you have fun last night? I sure did. Good. Jerry. Okay, I think probably the most appropriate thing to do would be to uh, introduce everybody who is going to be here having this conversation with you today. So I am Susan Johnson Taylor, and I am an OT who um, worked in the clinic for about 35 years, most recently at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, now known as the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, um, and now work for New Motion and Training and Education. I'm Ann Kieschnick. I'm from Houston, Texas. I also am with New Motion. I've been in ATP for 38 plus years. As I like to say, I was credentialed in the early, or late 1900s. Um, so ATP Last and century. CRTS. Last century. Hi, I'm Jeannie Minkle. And first of all, thank you for coming to this session. And uh, we really appreciate the, the stalwarts that stick in for the for the last day on Friday, so thank you. Uh, I am a Senior Vice President of Care Management and Rehab Services for Independent Care System. We're a care management organization that supports people with physical disabilities to live in their own homes in New York City. Good morning. I'm Weezy Walker. I was a seating specialist for a number. I worked the pleasure of working with Susan that when, when they first invented the wheel. Right? In the last century. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, after retirement, uh, I'm executive director of the National Registry. Of Rehab, Rehab Technology, Technology Suppliers. I'm sorry, but I had a lot of fun at the party last night. I just want to <laughs> warn everybody. Um, I'm Carmen DeGiovene. Um, I'm a clinical associate professor at The Ohio State University. I think the reason I'm up here is I'm, um, I'm also the director of admissions for an occupation, our occupational therapy program. Um, and we're starting an assistive technology certificate program. So as you can see, I'm very passionate about education and where the field is going and where the potential um, pathways are um, to get into this field. And, and so I think that's, that's why the perspective that I'm going to bring, bring today. We just, we needed one guy to balance. <laughs> just, I'm the only guy in my department, too, so I'm used to it. You're used to it. Oh, my God. So we took kind of a big chance, and we had like, I don't know, seven or 11 slides, because we don't want the focus to be on us up here just telling you things. We would also like to hear your perspectives. This is, following, um, this is following themes from the plenary yesterday. It's actually following themes from the presentation that was just presented and a few others that have been scattered around the conference as well. Um, we were just talking about how this would actually make a good full day because we really need to figure out how we're going to manage this in the future. That would be the partnerships between, this, uh, between suppliers and therapists service delivery and other issues like that. So we've already talked about how we got started in all this. We've already talked about the fact that we had the luxury of time. We used to have the luxury of time. But just because we don't have the luxury of time anymore, we still have a, lot, a huge capacity that we need to, uh, need to fill of people who really need to be seen and need our expertise. Um, we are at this place. We're going to talk about what that means. And we're going to talk a little bit with you about um, how we go forward from here. Um, and I hate to keep coming back to Jerry Dickerson, but 
Uh, I really, I really think <laughs> it's really off now. Except you called him Jerry Warren yesterday, but yes. well, only some of us knew that. Warren? Oh my. God. Well, I keep calling her Wheezy Griffin because when I first met her, she was Wheezy Griffin. Jerry Dickerson, that guy right there, um, has said uh, over and over again to, to make us start thinking: Are we going to be a one-generation profession? And I hope not. Okay, so I'm going to sit down and stop wandering around. What now? Jessica was the originator of the concern. Ah, oh, all right. Well, then I will, I will, I will say that from now on. Okay. Now the problem, the problem with uh, presenting not up on the stage <laughs> is I have to keep turning back and looking. Okay. So I really want the yeah because usually it's right here. Um, I really want to talk about partnership responsibilities, and I actually want to stop talking and get everybody else to start talking. So one of the things that I think Car Carmen and I were talking about this actually a lot when we were preparing the plenary session. And one of the things that he said is, well, you know, there's overlap in every profession. I mean, there's overlap in OT and PT, but there's still OT and PT, okay? There's an overlap in between uh, suppliers who are ATPs and therapists, but there's still suppliers and therapists. We have two separate roles, which was just talked about in the previous course. And actually, I would like some of you guys to start talking about some of the overlaps and what the, what the delicate balance means in, in between those professions. Well, I'll start. How about that? Um, so just going back to that conversation, I, I, the, the thing that it made me think of is engineering. That's what I know, so that's what I go back to um, oftentimes. And, and the thing that um, I think resonated, um, that, that the light bulb went off, was when I started talking about mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. You, mechanical engineers have to understand the Mike electrical is part. Electrical engineers have to understand the mechanical part. And if you look at a power wheelchair today, that's a perfect example of it. And you have to have that overlap, and you have to be able to communicate yourself. You have to be able to communicate among the group, or else you would have a Bluetooth device on a power wheelchair that would never work, or you'd have a joystick that would never actually communicate with the motors and the, the frame and stuff like that. So it's a real simple example, but I tend to be a simple guy. So um, it, it kind of helps frame this discussion around OTs, PTs, ATPs. Um, I even hear it in my world, I hear it about where is athletic training and how do they fit in with physical therapists. So this happens all the time. This is. It's actually quite cool to me because this is part of the growing pains of a profession, and that goes back to the slide that Mark had up two days ago now about the profession. These are the things, this is actually good because if you look at the development of a profession, this means that we are developing. I'm going to jump in. Partnership, I've been thinking, it's kind of a lot like a marriage. Sometimes it's a 70-30 or a 60-40. Um, I think we all have to work at it. And part of that's being transparent. And it's that communication part that we all need within each other. Um, and I think as working with new ATPs, part of my role is development. So working with knowing your role, knowing your scope, and um, fulfilling that role. So do what you do, do it well, be knowledgeable, and when you don't know, you reach out to each other. Because I think I was blessed in when I grew up in this industry is that we did have strong partnerships. We were all growing together. We all had a piece of plywood and some foam and this thing in Texas we called Naga Hide. And we took Naga Hide and a hand staple gun and uh -huh. stapled it to a bottom of a board and put it in a seat and went, oh, we have custom seating. Look how well they sit. Mm -hmm. So we had that partnership. We, we And I, I'm so privileged to have grown up in that to see where we are today. I think we have a myriad of opportunities and technologies. It's fabulous, but we've forgotten that we still need that partnership to learn and apply it and make it appropriate. So I, I, I take it to like it's, we have our day marriages, so our seating techs, the supplier, the clinicians, we all need each other because we are not successful without each other. Our clients, if it's a client focus, we lose that without that partnership. So just building on what the mechanical engineer needs to know and the uh, electrical engineer needs to know, says the physical therapist, by the way. Uh, 
I think there's been a lot of emphasis in our industry about what's the clinical knowledge that the supplier needs to know and where's the bright line and where's the scope of practice. Da, 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 da. I don't think there's been nearly enough of what does the clinician need to know about the business practice? What are those obstacles to efficient delivery? I, I always am intrigued when a therapist says to me, well, the supplier should just provide that. And I say to them, and what part of your paycheck are you leaving on your desk? It, it, it is that trust comes from mutual understanding. And mutual understanding is, starts with, I don't really know what you do. So I, I would really, as we talk about the moving forward, the business can't be this mystery black box over here. And it also can't be, well, this is all I can offer. Well, why is that? And being willing to say, what you're offering isn't meeting this person's need. And this goes back to where is the, clin the client voice? Mm -hmm. and, there's, and I always ask the question of the client, what's your day like? As I think we get so wrapped up in, this is our clinical acumen, this is our coding situation, this is our funding situation. Like, what time did you have to wake up in the morning to be here for a 10 o'clock appointment or a 9 o'clock appointment or an 8.30 appointment? Uh, we have none of those in New York City, by the way. <laughs> There's no aid or transportation that's going to get somebody there. But th so just yeah. being really mindful of you know your world, how well do you know your partner's world? I think on the supplier side, you know, in, in my role, I, I get to talk to consumers and, um, and, and suppliers from all over the country and clinicians. Um, and, and I hear this conversation, you know, we talk about clinical settings for evaluations, but we know that doesn't always happen. So a lot of times the supplier is working, and I, I ask you to come up with an, what is a non-seating clinician? What, what would we call that person? They're, they're still a clinician, but they don't have the... So the, an, either an, a, a non-specialist or maybe a, okay. a generalist therapist? A generalist, or, okay. So yeah. then the supplier is kind of taking on a, a very different role um, than when they would work with, you know, like Chris. When I worked with Chris at Shepherd, you know, uh, we, we worked very well together, but if I went into a home environment with a, the treating therapist, I'll call, ah, I'll call go. them good, that. Good, good, all right. You know, then I would have to kind of guide them through the process. They, they knew how to do the evaluation, but I had to tell them, you know, this is what we need. And uh, we have this tool, this, uh, this uh, evaluation form that Jessica did, and it's actually on our website. And when I read through it, I was like, geez, you know, uh, I retired. <laughs> I guess. But, um, you know, and I, I think, um, unfortunately, there could be situations where the supplier would take advantage of that situation. And that's what I worry about is, you know, what options did that supplier offer? And did the therapist know that, that maybe there were better options or, you know, whatever? And uh, there was actually a lady in my hometown that called me and you know the chair was it was just dropped off and uh and, and the mother i said you know what i said to her i said you're too nice quit being so nice <laughs> you know your son didn't get the right cushion the chair wasn't fit correctly and you're not being ugly or mean you're just that is his right to have you know what works best for him so we're constantly trying to figure out ways to educate um, on the supplier side to how to handle that situation and do it. But that's to my point. Look at all the education we put on the supplier side. 
I don't think we put nearly as much on the clinician side uh -huh. to understand. So we'll blame yeah. it on the clinician. No, there's no blame here. It's all, uh, it's all out there. It's the clinician's yeah. fault. Okay. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm an uh, ATP supplier. I've been in Come business on. for 35, 40 years or so. And uh, uh, the missing component is the payer. We used to be, we'd be able to take product as a supplier local to a local Medicaid office and, d and, and uh, do in-services about the product and what it does. They're completely out of the loop now. And until, so the ground is always shifting underneath the supplier. We don't have firm ground to stand on. So it's hard for us to provide what may be the most appropriate. I feel like I'm violating standards and practices all the time, and that I have to lower my bar to do the job that I used to be able to do. And until that gets straightened out, um, it's almost like we're pushing against a, a huge if, tide. I would, I would challenge this, and, and I've had these conversations over and over and over again. As a supplier, you cannot have a preconceived idea of this is what funding covers. That shouldn't be your approach. It's to determine what is best for that client. And then, and I know you do, I know you do. And, and, the, and there are limitations, I, you know, I get that. But, um, the, you know, the funding should not be the, the driver. The driver. Before. No, before. Before. Thank you. Hold that word. Hold that word. <laughs> Hold that word. Now, we're now, now we're heading downward. We're on the downs, downward slide where funding is driving it. It should not be the, the, the reason. So there has to be more. It's the, it's the biggest problem. You know, you know what another into. problem is? Is people are not Everybody got, advocating. The suppliers got in, is, a lot of suppliers got into this business um, from a passionate uh, standpoint. Usually, you know, there was some type of what they, they didn't just get into it to make money. There's easier ways to make money. So sir, there's an artistry about this business. There's a passion about this industry. And most right. people are in it for the right reasons. And after we went over that hill and started going downward, um, it seems like everybody stopped fighting. We used to take everything to fair hearing. We would fight everything. We'd fight the insurance companies. We'd fight the state funding, um, you know, whatever the payer sources might have been. And we would bring the clients in, and we would get fair hearings, and they'd be overturned. And then every time somebody would, uh, an insurance company or a payer would come in and, um, and then override what the, what the fair hearing judge Came, came to the conclusion with. You just had to keep fighting. Everybody just got frustrated, it seems. And I just want to pause, because part of our message here is really to be looking to what the future, the future. needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to acknowledge, and it certainly yeah. is, it is not an easy time to be in this business. That, yeah. There is no doubt about that. Part of the biggest challenge is the entire healthcare payment structure is moving. So it's really important for us not to keep saying, how are we going to get the fee-for-service funding changed? Right. That's not changing. That's going to go away. How do we get the value statement that includes complex rehab? So for this discussion, for right now, I know it's a false assumption, but let's say there's a bundled cost, and there's an agreement as to what that bundled cost how should the service delivery be so that that bundle cost meets the consumer, the clinician, and the supplier's need? Just wait, wait, wait. Okay. Um, it, there's a microphone going around, but this is perfect. Be, so. um, I just wanted to add on to the, the comments earlier, I, and I agree that the payer needs to be part of the process. You mentioned um, going to see the payer and showing them the equipment. I would um, assert that what we should be laying the foundation for is going as a team in explaining the yes. team process and the services, the clinical related services and the technology related services, how they're the same and different and why the collaborative team approach is value added. Yep. Yes, I would definitely like to add, add to that, Laura. Um, and we were discussing this in one of the courses yesterday is, uh, I, I mean, you know, when, when you work in a clinical world like, like I did, 
you're a little bit insulated, well, actually you're a lot insulated from actually what's going on in, you know, across the country. And it was quite a surprise to me to realize that um, across the country, um, uh, payers are not even requiring therapy evaluations anymore. What does that mean for a clinical partnership? If, you, if you're not requiring a therapy evaluation, how does the evaluation get paid for in some instances or asked for in some instances so that we can be a clinical team? So that's just food for thought while somebody else has a, a question. So I wanted to piggyback on, on one of the comments you made about an inappropriate delivery. And one of the concerns I've always had is if we're seeing that, I think the therapist should be have knowledge of that delivery. Oftentimes, there's a complaint, it's not right, everybody complains, but what's the next step? The therapist who wrote that LMN and recommended that equipment, and, you know, they have to be involved in that process to solve that problem, right? <laughs> yeah, and you know, we all make before. mistakes. We're, yeah. we're all human. And when we learn from that, right? Exactly. Together at the delivery. When there's a pattern uh -huh. of drop, deliver, and go, often, I do my own deliveries as an ATP, right? Uh, and, and there are other companies that don't. I think it's very important that that person that specs that equipment is heavily involved with that consumer. Be involved in that delivery, right? So I think there's, there's a big issue there. And then the other thing I was gonna say is, in this bundled model that we're moving towards, the challenge is, and you mentioned it before, I'd love to provide the best equipment. In my opinion, anyone that's in a manual chair should have a K5. You can position the wheels, it's appropriate for propulsion, but we're stuck in this model that, you know, why does the geriatric woman that's got arthritic conditions get a K1? Right. And, and, and you know, she may not propel as long or as far, but that stress and strain on the shoulder is still relevant, as, as relevant as someone that's more active that is gonna be maybe taking more advantage of the K5. But it's just one example. In a bundled world, when we're moving away from this fee for, for service, we're stuck because we are limited by that dollar amount. Like it or not, we can't provide that better But you're applying the code product. word, code world, yeah. onto what could be a value-based system. If the dollars are right in the bundled thing, we can talk, but let's face That's, it, for the most well, part, those dollars aren't right. They're just going down. Yet, yet. They want to bundle it at a lower cost. We, you know, we, we can't provide a, a higher quality product. Yet. That's the challenge, yet. I mean, yet. you know, our managed, we're in New York, and our, our MLTCs are, are ridiculous. You know, they're paying for all the environmental mods, but all the DME, all of these private companies, are just lowering the rates. And of course, if you want to be a provider with them, you got to play the games and you got to try and make them happy. In the straight Medicaid system, as long as we were enrolled with Medicaid, the Medicaid fee schedule would apply across the board. Now, Let me they're privatizing you Medicaid. Medicaid. It's the fox guarding the hen house. <laughs> yeah. Let me talk to you afterwards. I think yeah. there's opportunity in the MLTC world. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I would do that. I just wanted to circle back. You keep talking about educating the clinician or educating the supplier, but I feel like the disconnect is educating the patient because at the clinic that I'm at, we stress deliveries in our clinic, but that patient will still call me and say, I'm not coming in and I can't hold their chair hostage. Um, and we have implemented a policy that the clinician calls the patient and explains to them the benefits of it. Um, but I feel like the patient has to truly appreciate what that clinic delivery and clinic model offers versus that home health therapist that is treating them for their hip arthritis. Why can't that therapist who's already coming out address that issue? Why do they have to take the trip to the clinic, see all these people, come back for multiple visits, come back for training, come back for fittings? I feel like they have to understand what we offer also. So I have a question for you while you still have the mic. And um, I had the benefit of being in the session before, and this issue actually came up. Do you describe the delivery process at the beginning of the eval? Yeah, the patient gets a letter that walks them through the steps of what happens, and the last step is you will come back to the clinic. So briefly. make it the first item. I we welcome you, reading but part reading of our process is you have to come back for the delivery put the most important thing first mm -hmm. and then I think we were having this discussion earlier 
there are times that you absolutely can hold the, the equipment hostage because it's your clinical practice. They asked you to sign the letter of medical necessity. This is the closure of your treatment plan. So, and I'm the first to say, you know, consumer focused, patient centered care, but part of that education is starting right up the top. Right. I would like to challenge everyone. We talk, you will come back. Oh, you will do this. Is. The education is not a directive, but it, why are you coming back? But, Your chair may not be fit to you or set up appropriately as a clinician. I'm making the recommendation. Our team, this evaluation, we've identified through your goals, what we've seen on the mat eval, and the equipment pieces we've put together to recommend it. Mm -hmm. And when you come back, we put all those pieces yeah. together and a final puzzle. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be very yeah, careful of the instructions of what Absolutely. we're calling education, <laughs> because we're all saying, you have to come back. Yeah. I know what's best for you. Right. No, you will right. do what I say. And maybe we, it's not what we intend, but I think that's, that's part the of the impact. message. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think if we across. also really step nice. back and say, <laughs> yep. And as a and as a field, and I think we talked about this a, a little bit yesterday. As a field, we have allowed this to become about equipment, mm -hmm. and we have so devalued. Not that we devalue, but we haven't shouted from the mountaintops enough about the service. Anybody can provide a widget. Any, go on Amazon and order whatever, but not everybody can provide a clinical or a supplier technical. service. Technical service. We used to say the difference is the application. The difference is in the fit. Mm -hmm. We can all put all the pieces on the floor and put them all together. You can get it from Amazon.com in 24 hours if you've got Prime. But it's a matter of how is it applied and how is it fitted. That's the difference. That's the art. That is, you know, the science is putting it kind of all together, but the art is how we fit it and apply it. Well, I would like to make a parenthesis here, saying that I'm really, really happy that I'm not alone, and I come from <laughs> Europe. <laughs> and uh, I have the same exact struggle on educating suppliers, educating clinicians, educating clients for the last 19 years. So I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the buzz line is misery loves company. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wow, it's worldwide misery. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> have funding problems. Mm -hmm. We have the same problems it's, you guys have. Yeah. So it's not your funding, not it's, it's really knowledge. Like, I, I, I blame the universities first. <laughs> <laughs> All right! <laughs> oh, no! Yeah. Roll your socks down. Roll your you socks down. Teach anything <laughs> for wheelchairs. <laughs> um, I cannot believe even therapists how much they don't know and then the doctor doesn't know and then somebody has a pressure injury and they're going to see a pressure mm. wound care clinic and I go but it why didn't you guys send them to us it's the chair you know so it's really when you remove the funding problem you'll have the same problems I'm telling you um, so really university question. step up mm. <laughs> and one university did in Canada I don't know if Paul is here. Un University of Montreal has uh, um, an elective on wheelchair seating, 45 hours, and they get a credit. And I'm hoping that's where it's going to go for the future. And uh, uh, to, to sort of add on to that, it's so the, the universities are a fabulous setting for education for, for some of us and some folks. We, we're having, and this is a much longer discussion, but how do we educate people coming into the supplier field as well as their seating technicians? NARTS is working on this. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said that. I would like to talk about, um, we talk about all the credentials and education, but I'm always amazed when we get to the review part and the hearings and you fight, fight, fight. The responses of the reviewer, like what's their credentials? What's their baseline? I feel like I'm talking oh, to the circus and the judge and the rehearing. I would love to know if they're a rehab nurse or what their background is. I think there's so much disconnect with even with the reviewer reading Good rehab point. language and their interpretation. And you can tell by the questions they fire back, it's ridiculous. It's like, well, that isn't, relevant at all here 
but I think if we were on the same page with the reviewers, I think things would be maybe easier to process through. So I just want to give a little bit of context. Um, I've, I've been on the payer side, and um, I've actually been the reviewer. And <laughs> I, the perspective I want to share is, in the insurance world, they think about high cost, high needs people. And if you ask an insurer who are their high cost, high needs people, they'll talk about people with behavioral health issues that go to the emergency room every three weeks, every three days. They'll talk about people who have substance use and abuse. They'll talk about people with multiple chronic conditions, you know, diabetes and congestive heart failure. When you ask them about people with long-term physical disabilities, like they're like deer in the headlights. And part of our message needs to be, we have a community of people who are not looking for cures, but they need the supports that provide the care. And that some of their care is expensive, but if it is being appropriately provided, it's a five-year purchase. It's the intervention that addresses the high-risk pressure problem. It's the social isolation that the community first option is supposed to be going after. So what's really important, our, our community are the people that we see all the time. We think about people with complex rehab needs all the time. In an insurance world, it's the hair on the dog that's standing in front of the truck. It's just a much smaller group of people. And I think for us to come forward and say this, and you know, the way to talk about it is duels under the age of 65. And literally an insurance will go, oh, you know something about them? Yeah, we know something about them. But it, it's, it's talking the same language. So, and absolutely, I think it's fine to say to the reviewer, can you tell me your clinical background or your medical background? And very often, and we went line by line, like, well, are you aware that this links to this? Oh, it looked like a separate item that wasn't needed on the chair. Right, which is why we put them together. So just in the spirit of, you know, can you explain this invoice to your mother? Because that's probably the skill level of the person reviewing it. And that, my response to that is, why all that energy and my education done? Is it all the phone? Line by line? That takes a lot of time and energy and cost. They should know that. Yeah. Should is the they operative should, yeah, word. Yeah. Should. But they're also getting. Should this person have a CAT scan? Should this person have a, a, a barium swallow? Should they, I mean, they're, they're like this. And, and I think in the spirit of, do you have a catastrophic group? Is there a group of people that I can provide some background to that will be useful on a more frequent basis? So some of that's just, you know, you gotta reach out to the other side. Offer the olive branch. But recognize. <laughs> How, and furthermore, who we think are, you know, people should know about people with physical disabilities. Well, they don't. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we can bring to them that will help them understand it? Somebody used the example of uh, well, uh, talking to an executive and saying, if you went in and got a custom fitted suit, but the day you arrived for delivery, the pieces were just on the table, well, that wouldn't be very good. Right, that's part of what our clients are facing. So sometimes putting it in other people's terms might make a difference. But thanks for bringing the problem, because reviewing yeah, is a problem. And what's the motivation of the reviewer? Save money. Are they getting a reimbursement by saving? There's yes. a real conflict, yes. but again, for another. Reasons to deny. That could be a whole nother session. Yep. It could be.
So one of the things that your comment back there made me think of and your response is, um, and having worked on both sides now, both sides, oh my gosh, listen to me, in both realms now, um, <laughs> clinical and in the supplier world, which has an entirely different language and makes me feel bad that I ever used ATNR and STNR in front of people before because they have a whole other group of business terms that... There she is, AT and R. OIP and WIP, and I don't know, anyway. So it's okay. taken me four years to figure out what the vocabulary is. Um, is that we're probably not doing a very good job of letting each other know what we do mm -hmm. internally, That's the, the, the things that you can let know, because for example, um, at the place where I work, I've been involved in a number of clinical in-services to huge groups of case managers for large insurance companies who are, have been very interested in the information mm -hmm. about like, okay, these are, these are things. This is what the things do for your clients. Uh, please come sit in this manual tilt or power tilt. And it, I mean, it's like light bulbs go off all, all, all along the way. But I'll bet a lot of you had no idea that that, that went on. Um, similarly, there's a clinician task force, and I'll bet most people who work primarily in the supplier realm have no idea that there's this giant room full of clinicians who are trying to promote complex rehab technology. So I, I within the canonical community, with, recognizing yes, within, that, the, yeah. within anywhere. I mean, it, it's I, I, we're not doing a very good job of keeping each other informed. I think that was and and, and it can be you know in my experience, I would be able to talk to that reviewer, and on several occasions, I developed a relationship with that person because there was trust. I don't know why they trusted me that they did, but they did. But you know, where that your southern charm, that, you see, come on, what it is. That, as that, opposed to the velvet steamroller, <laughs> where where they would call me, uh, you know, with other you know things that I hadn't submitted, but someone else, and just say, "Can I run this by you?" And um, unfortunately, that that's not a solid solution because some reviewers. Really, you know, I have one tell me, well, the patient has ALS. Well, he's going to die, you know. Okay. And I said, I think we all die, don't we? I mean, yeah. I don't, you know. <laughs> anyway. Or in the pediatric world, they'll go, well, you know, they don't have a very long life expectancy. And I'm like, okay, get hit by a car tomorrow. <laughs> what happens if they live? Yeah. Um, so I'll. Well. It's Oh, did you want to say something? <laughs> you, should, you should say something, Carmen. I'm keeping no, no, we have no, 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 go ahead. Let Tom. Like being home. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Well, I do. I have, I have, I have two daughters and, and my wife, and I don't get a word in edge twice. So. <laughs> it's not going to be different here. I just wanted to talk a little bit about, I've worked for a large group of compassionate, caring people, therapists, suppliers, manufacturers. And we want to create change, so how do we do that? I challenge each and every one of you in this room and in the industry, when was the last time you went and visited your congressman? When was the last time you went and visited your yeah, yeah, yeah. You might think that your voice, you, I don't really need this. Yes, you do. Yes, yeah, you, you do. do. Yes, you, yes, you do. do. It's a big room. You might think that your voice is one voice, but, you know, Encart and Arts, this is not a commercial, this is a fact. They go to Washington every year. And I, in my state of Texas, one of the largest states in the country. I'm a little bit embarrassed that we have three people go to Washington to advocate for our industry. And it's, it's a little bit sad. And I think we need to change that. We sit here and talk and we talk about payers and we talk about Medicaid, but when's the last time you did something to save your industry? And I challenge each of you to look in the mirror when you get home and see what you can do to make Thank it happen. Thank you, Tom. And you don't have mm -hmm. to go to Washington, D.C. Right. Your NAR, district NAR office. And the Clinician Task Force are, are working together, and I like to call it the dream team, because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we can identify these states, and you have then you have a clinician who's used to advocating and, and the supplier. Um, and, and everybody knows a great one of your consumers that, that can 
speak for themselves. And th doing it at home is easier and, and very, very effective. And, and Tom is right. Um, how many of you have ever done any kind of advocacy? Oh. I'm preaching well, to the uh, choir. I know. Well, about that's why they're in the room. At, that's that's why they're in the room at 9 or more. I think, uh, I think everything that we're talking about, um, it, it all circles back to responsibility. There's a lot of finger pointing, oh, it's my supplier, oh, it's the university. Mm -hmm. It's my fault. I'm an occupational therapist and an ATP, and if I'm not getting the equipment that I need for my patients, I need to change what I'm doing. Um, and I've been doing a lot of advocacy. I've been asking for things that I know aren't going to be covered because they're the right thing to ask for and not toning down my recommendations based on the codes. Um, I think that's very important. Um, my state of Wisconsin, the, medical, um, the Medicaid model is actually starting to cover power seat elevation now because they've had so many requests flooding in for it and how beneficial it is. And a lot of those were me and my fellow therapists not giving up on that. Um, and I guess I'm spoiled. Uh, I have the supplier in my office. Uh, some of our managed care organizations have the social worker that's making the equipment decision, right. the nurse, the DME uh, coordinator, all in my office for the eval. Um, my physicians are just down the, down the doorway. We use a template where I put things into a flow sheet and it populates into my note and their note. So we're saying the same thing. We're breaking down a lot of those barriers because you see the problems that you're having, the delays in the paperwork, you fix it. You see the decision making isn't including everybody, you fix it, you get more chairs in your office. It's that easy. So uh, I wanna just say, you're not spoiled. Mm -hmm. You identified in your own ecosystem mm -hmm. the challenges and you mm -hmm. stood up and said, what is my action that can help move this through. So kudos and uh, Very good. Midwesterners uh, are really nice people so I was, congratulations. I want to say one thing before you speak because I might forget after. Um, one of, <laughs> Thank you Jerry. The video will be at six. Um, the, uh, one of my first experiences uh, going to the hill was with uh, one of Jenny Peleg's um, cute little girl in a in a manual wheelchair. I, I think she had spina bifida. And she, had, you know, she was pushing around, and we went into the a member's office and we sat down and you know everybody the, the, the kid was the, obviously the star, you know. But I went through the spiel of this is what you know we had to go through and blah 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 you know yada 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 and we and we came out and the mother looked at me and she said i had no idea i said no idea what she said all that stuff you were telling them about how you have to you know all the steps in the process and it, it just it was like you know we we aren't sharing this, uh, I guess you call it pain, you know, uh, when you journey, to, journey, for journey, people journey. to know Glass what you bowl. have to go through, what we all go through to, to make this happen. And uh, we really let that mom down, I think. Um, I was gonna say, I think my, the general thing, consensus here is we're taking for granted our knowledge and our comfort with this population and with this equipment and um, versus the general public and versus I'm a clinician and I'm on the clinician's task force. We had to advocate to our governing bodies the importance of wheeled seating and mobility and they just got on board with us. And, and how long did that take? 10 years. 10, 15 10 years. 2019, right? Yeah, like it's 2019 now. And I mean, we just, it was in the last couple of years that we got them on board with us. So, um, and then, you know, I go out, I do a lot of adaptive sports things as well. And I go out in the community with my consumers all the time. And the knowledge of the general public, the things that, the interactions that we have with the general public still shock me after a decade of going out in the community of like, what did you just ask him? You know, like, oh, and what, and um, and I think um, 
also, when I got into advocacy in the first place, um, that was my biggest take home as well, was that people just truly do not know what we do, who we are, why we do it, what the equipment is. Um, and as we kind of started hinting at, advocacy does not need to be on the hill. It can be in your own clinic, with your physicians, with other clinicians in your clinic, with the patients, with other people in the community. Um, you know, I take every interaction I have with people as an opportunity to explain what we do and still am learning how little people know. Um, and so just taking every moment that you have with any person that you will run into that doesn't know what you do to teach them what you do, um, you know, and general practitioners. And I mean, these are all people that just, they don't, they just don't know. And so taking that time to do the ed education, that can be your version of advocacy um, within your own communities. And it can, we can spread it if we all work together. Carmen. Can I talk now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, still at home. Um, What's our timing? Are we yeah. 15 more working? Oh. So I have 15 minutes to talk. <laughs> no. um, you know, a, a couple. So th this. So I know my strengths. I know my limitations. My my strength is to sit back and listen to a conversation and to kind of, I feel like pull some of the things out of it. Um, anybody a Kai Rizdahl fan? Thank you. Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeannie. <laughs> Um, words matter. He always says words matter. And, and the thing I keep hearing is fight, fight, fight. That's great when you're on the field. That's not the, that's not the language that we need to have. And, and so I think that's like a simple thing that we can all do. Um, the other thing that I heard was, um, I, sorry, I don't know your name from the Midwest, but. I, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, right? Wisconsin. So I'm, um, I heard a level five leader there, so I talked about that a little bit yesterday. Somebody who's willing to take responsibility when it doesn't work and give out credit to everybody else. Um, I think we all, we all need to do that. Um, and the third and last comment is around the education component. Um, I, so I'm an engineer. I worked in a, at the assistive technology unit at UIC, so I was out in the community all the time before. I got involved with um, Ohio State's OT program, and, and now I know about accreditation. Um, and so there's only so many pieces and parts that we can put into an academic program. Mm -hmm. Where the opportunity stands is all of these academic programs have field work, have capstone, have, they all call them doctoral experience, they're all calling them different things. We're not gonna be able to change, I'm not gonna be able to to create 48 new OTs that are gonna be able to do seating mobility evals, but I'm gonna be able to find five to 10 that are willing to take our advanced AT course, and then they're gonna go out and work with you. So you, you can easily reach out to all of your universities that have an OT, a PT program, or even these health science programs that are starting at the undergrad level. And you can reach out to them and say, I wanna participate in your field work, your capstone, whatever the word may be, and you start training these people as they're getting that academic component. And I think that's an easy win while the University of Pittsburgh, the Ohio States, the University of Illinois, Chicago, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and I bring those up because the other three, not Ohio State yet, have um, accreditation from Resna around creating the next generation of rehab science and technologists. Um, we're gonna be keep working on that in the long run, and this is something that you can do in the short run. And Weezy, can you talk about NART's efforts? Uh, absolutely. Um, about a year and a half ago, after how many years of discussion, the, the board said it's time for us to look at developing a certificate program. We don't know where new people are gonna come into the field. Um, it's not, people don't even know the field exists, number one. And so we have uh, launched that initiative. And uh, it's probably like building a house. It'll take a lot longer than you expect, <laughs> but it'll be an accredited program. And then someone who's, I get those phone calls all the time. People are like, you know, well, I want to, I'd love to do this. So unless someone's willing to employ that person, and, and, and just train them up and mentor them. Um, but a lot of providers, you know, it's, it's not feasible financially to do that. So this program 
will provide them the basic knowledge that that person needs uh, to be a supplier, and, and I'll quote Gene as, they will come out of it to know what they don't know to do no harm. And, and then you would build on that um, as you start working and gain the experience and the more advanced uh, skills that, that are involved. And, and we know, you know, um, I think everyone would agree it's a vast array of skills that you need to, for the best outcomes. And so we're very excited about it. Maybe, you know, when we're back here in two years, um, Maybe so. we'll have, right. I hope Getting it's with the end in mind. sooner than that, yeah, but you never know. You'll be reporting so, on the number of people who've acquired exactly. their credentials, um, their and certificate. I, and I would like to also mention that um, uh, we reached out to a lot of different stakeholders, and, and it's a unanimous consensus that we needed this, it should have been done a long time ago, and, you know, that I hear people are getting older, and, you know, nope. I don't, I don't know average. what to say about We're that. above, We're above average. average. We're above average. <laughs> and I think, too, those that are above average, we have the beauty of some hindsight, and we, what I still hear is it's painful, and it's change, and it's funders. I can tell you I remember the days of the golden commode and we thought the world was going to come to an end. And here we are in 2019 with advanced technology, certification programs, credentialing, all kinds. We've come a long way. There's a lot of really good things. So I think, too, part of it is those words, mm -hmm. is this is an incredible journey. We have an incredible impact on not only our lives, I mean, I think that impact's great, customers, clients, patients, people that, you know, that we work with and serve. Um, so I think, too, I want to leave, everyone to leave this room with not just that this is, oh, it's another drudgery and yes. the funding's beating us down. If we do what's right and if we keep that model in mind, the rest will be followed. The challenges have always been there. When I talk to new ATPs and I go, if you don't like change, and you don't like challenge, and you You're want it to be the rock. same, this is not yeah. the industry for you. Yeah. You need to look for something else, because that is not our world. But really, if you sit down and look in your heart, I think that's what we all thrive on. We love the challenge, we love the puzzle, and we're all pretty good at it. So to leave with that kind of a note versus kind of some of the other things we sometimes can walk out of the room and, oh, woe is me. Yeah. I would hate to leave the wonderful symposium on that note and not on, a, on the one that we've all built. Hi, this is Christy. I, I, uh, I'm new to this field and I, I was recently working with regenerative medicine in the Army, so i totally new to this field. Um, but I have a, a request because I think that this is a big love festival in here around the same topic and with the same goals. But from the perspective of uh, somebody that was a federal employee that was involved in policy and regulation and funding, if we don't have data that is published and peer reviewed in the public domain, policymakers, regulators, and other government people that can affect change don't have data to go fight your fight on the inside. So while I really love what you are talked about and the leadership you've talked about, Please write it down and, and get it out into the public domain because those were the tools that I had to fight in regenerative medicine for hand and face transplants. And without that written down, I couldn't fight your fight for you. So give those feds that, that opportunity. Great. Thank Great you. Point. Yeah. I just want to also leave on a high note for the above average in the room. Um, <laughs> passion's taken us a long way. Yeah, you know, how many of your people, peer group, you know, retirement is like, oh, thank God, that, that part of my life is over, and I'm looking to, to, to the next chapter. And how many of us have stuck around because we actually love what we do? And I think the, the biggest challenge is figuring out ways to keep the why in what we do, and figure out the, the new hows and what's and, and have that be inviting to younger folks and you know, equally ask them, how would you do this in 2019? Because there may be some new and better ideas. So I I think we've got I think we have gotten and I said this yesterday and I firmly believe it, we have gotten really far away from the why and the client and the reason that we do this in the first place 
nobody's fault. We're all ridiculously busy. But as Jeannie said, and as Anne put so eloquently, if we keep keep track of the why, of this is why I'm doing this. I love problem solving, and I do it really well in a team of people. Mm -hmm. To your um, comment about data, I mean, we have outcome measures. And I was just as guilty as anybody else. I'm, I'm too, I am like too busy in clinic. I'm not filling out this. And who's going to follow it up? And how are we even going to do that? To your point again, if we don't have outcome data, um, we're going to continue in this field with, you know, N equals 25. OK. Meanwhile, at the federal government level, it's like N equals 150,000 or more or a million. Um, so that's, um, I think all of us would agree on the panel uh, that that's the data, while it's not very interesting to do, um, says who? Is necessary. Okay. <laughs> says, says, says the OT who yeah. just learned how to do Excel spreadsheets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my, my, I have a, a daughter who's a biomedical engineer, and she's like, you just learned how to do Excel spreadsheets. What is the matter with? They're so easy. I'm like, never say that to me again. Anyway. Does anybody else have any closing comments that they would like to get in? Yes. 2025, I'd like to see holograms of our clients at delivery so we can just kind of look and everyone can visualize that fitting in. A and I want smart seating on a hovercraft. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I wanted to say, um, first and foremost, I've been coming to these for I've been in the business for 35 years now. And Gene, what? I gotta admit, love listening to you. And I think from the crowd, we wish that more classes were like this with the back and forth. Mm -hmm. We also wish that there was a uh, an ATP um, like Paul, I think I have the best ATP in the country over here. Um, but anyways, where I wanted to go with this is, Yes, most ATPs, the average age is 52 years old. Most PTs and OTs is 41. Um, yes, there are more white males. We're tired now. I'm at a point, <laughs> you said it, the fight isn't there. Now, I'll ask this to the doctor. There are 1.2 million physicians in the United States. What does a physician pay the AMA to fight for them? Is a doctor, does he have the time to go to Congress and fight to increase his pay? Uh, three years ago, the doctors were supposed to take a 20% cut in their pay, excuse me, a 10%. Instead, they got a 10% increase. I did the research, it's my understanding, they pay about $300 a year to the AMA, but not all 1.2 million do. 240,000 do. They hand the AMA 65 million a year in monies. If you took 20,000 providers, and I already pay Bright Tree $2,000 per month, not per year, per month, just to be able to bill a claim. So I look at it, if you have 20,000 providers, and we can include the manufacturers, and we could hand the AMA $100 million a year. Why can't we fight with the doctor? Because we are the extension of the physician, OTPT, when we provide that product. I just I like want to throw it out think, there. Matt. Yeah. <laughs> we have NARTS, we have NCART, we have Resna, we have all these groups, but they're all separate. Right. They're yes, not they're one. Outside. And we're not talking to each other. And the communication. Bring together. So I just wanted to throw it out there. Yep. And I'll let you respond to that. <laughs> well, NCART and NARTS do work very closely together to put this conference together every year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, Make it bigger. Across, right. Make the pool bigger. I just. I just want to plant a seed for the future, because that was the topic. Um, I, I've been going to a lot of the discussions in Washington, because that's where I am. And Jeannie's comment that fee-for-service is going away, I would just urge all of us to get on board with the bundled payment idea and the notion that we have no idea we don't have the data. We don't have the information of what our true costs are, because true cost is not just the widget. 
It's mm -hmm. the services, Service. technology yes. related services, the, the clinical so, related services, and, and what our impact is in the overall health care cost. And the economists um, will sit up on these panels and say, well, for the bundled payment, I'll ask, so what's the plan for DME and CRT? And their answer is, well, we're just going with competitive bidding because that works really well. So we don't ha we have to We're the wrong population. That's open, I, I love um, Rita um, Stanley will say, we have to open our kimono to <laughs> each other and share some of that confidential information so we can aggregate it and give that data to the policymakers so they can make informed decisions. We are behind. We are way behind. We are way conversations behind. are long gone. And I would like to see our industry have a strategy yep. for how we're going to meet that demand. Trust. Trust. Absolutely. Trust. Oh my gosh. So this turned out even better than even better <laughs> than we thought. And only because you were participating. Um, I think uh, our charge, audience. Our, yes, I think our charge might be for next year and the year after to uh, make this a, a longer session and do some problem solving about what we can do because we've identified problems. And work in between the conferences. No, we're not. Collaboratively. Working, we're not working in between conferences. <laughs> yes, and work in between the conferences. So with that, we thank you so much for getting up early and participating. Thank you.